Stories make us more human. I don't know quite exactly what I mean. It expands our humanity. And as you watch the stories of people, you can say, oh, he's so different from me. Or, oh, she's just like me. But we all come from different rivers, but we blend into the same river. And we all have joy. We all are lonely. We all have anger. We all have jealousy, you know, but it's different, but we're all the same. And these stories, listen to them and see who you are and who they are, okay? I mean, I just think stories are wonderful. And, um, you know, uh, these are all stories from people's lives. They wrote them, they rewrote them, they rewrote them, and then they add characters. I don't know if you know, theater began in Greece. And first they were just choruses singing stories. And then I think it was Aeschylus said, well, we can put a character in. And then somebody said, oh, we could put two characters in. And theater began to grow in Greece. So some of us have created characters, look for them. That's one of the things we worked on to make the pieces more theatrical. And I won't tell you any more. Where's Elliot? Right here. <laughs> go, go right the first pharmacy I ever managed was in a building that was built around 1900. I'm not that old. But um, one day, my lead clerk comes to me and she says, Elliot, Elliot, please hire my son this summer. I don't want him staying at home and watching TV on the sofa all summer. I said, have him talk to me. And I hired him. About a week later, I said, Tom, well, would you go out and lower the uh, awning? The sun is coming in through the window. He says, all right. And he goes out. Five minutes later, he comes back and he says, I quit. <laughs> I said, what do you mean you quit? What kind of a hair brain are you? <laughs> he said, go look outside. So I walk out the front door, and there's the awning lying on the ground. And I laugh. He said, that's not funny. I said, no. The bolts were that are probably were so rotten and, and that the, the awning, with you turning it, finally came down. You're not quitting. Well, two weeks later, Tom, when you go out on a delivery, would you stop across the street and, at the gas station and fill up with gas? He said, okay. 15 minutes later, Tom comes back in, walks into the pharmacy, throws the keys down, he says, I quit again. I said, what happened now? He says, go look outside. I walked to the front door, and I looked across the street to the gas station, and there's our delivery car, backed up against the gas pump, and the pump is on the ground, and there's gas all over. And I run back, and I pick up the phone and call the owner of the gas station, and then I accepted Tom's resignation. <laughs> the next time, a mother called me, would call me up and ask for me to hire her son, I would say, he's better off on the sofa. <laughs> relationship with travel over the many years has been up and down. When I was newly, when I've been married for a few years and living in California, in Oakland, 
um, I got a wonderful uh, surprise in the mail. Oh, honey, look, my parents have sent us money to go back to Buffalo, where we lived, for Thanksgiving, where we can see all our family and our friends again. You know, honey, I'm sorry, I have to work. I really don't think you should, and I don't really think you should go with the children. You know, Christopher is only two, and Mary Kim is only one, and I don't know how you'll manage. Oh, I've been a mother for a few years now. I, I can do this, I can handle this. Plus, I gotta show my babies off to my friends that I went to school with, you know how that goes. So, I hate to say my husband was right. <laughs> so he got on the plane, and I was sitting with Mary Kim in my lap, and Chris was on the aisle seat. Well, he was over two now, and he loved to use his little legs, so he was supposed to be playing with his little you know, truck and car, but he was trying to get away and run down the aisle. And then Mary Kim in my lap always liked books, and I was trying to show her her most best books that she ever liked, and she kept throwing them off the lap because she didn't want to sit there anymore. Oh, well, finally. Finally, they all went to sleep, and I thought things were going to be fine. And then some well-meaning flight attendant walked over and looked at them and said, Oh, they're so adorable! <laughs> at which point, of course, they woke up and started wailing all over again. <laughs> Well, we got to Chicago for our layover, and uh, as it happened, there was a vicious, unexpected snowstorm. <laughs> so, uh, we got onto, we got out of the plane all right, we get into the cafeteria, and I'm standing there with, uh, you know, Chris, Mary Kim, the diaper bag. And, and the cafeteria is absolutely packed because people are waiting for their flights. They've all been delayed. And I thought, nobody would ever get up and give me their seat, but they did eventually, and that, that all settled down. And then, of course, the next problem was, now this is the end of the 60s, and all your moms and grandmas out there know that there weren't changing tables in every, <laughs> in every restroom for diapers. So there I was in the corner of the terminal hoping nobody would see me and I'm changing the diapers again. That was not pleasant. Okay, well now the last thing we found out that made it even worse was that we had to go walk to the next terminal because of the snow there were a lot of problems. Okay, so I start out and I've got, as I said, Chris by the hand trying to get away from me, <laughs> Mary Kim in my arms, trying not to get away from me. And the diaper bag on my back, and I'm starting to walk, I wonder how I'm gonna get there. By the way, did I mention I was six months pregnant? Oh. <laughs> so along came this, I swear, St. Christopher type, big, tall guy, broad shoulders, handsome, Ma'am, you look like you could use a little help. <laughs> he put Chris on his shoulders, the ever popular diaper bag on his back. I carried Mary Kim, and we got on the plane. Yeah. A few years later, my husband joined a company that um, was taking its representatives to Hong Kong, uh, I guess to try to make some sales and make some contacts and so forth. It was in the late 70s, so uh, they were Chinese, they were English and British as well as Chinese in Hong Kong. And our, our, our group was called, the company was called Life USA. That's just because I kept the bandana. And we were all supposed to wear these, you know, and look really important and look impressive so that, you know, we could make some sales and all that kind of stuff. Okay. However, the uh, plane that they had arranged for us to fly on was a World Airways plane back in the late 70s. Mm -hmm. It only had one plane uh, in its fleet. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was uh, revamped so that it could take <coughs> tourists to Asia and then take 
uh, refugees from Southeast Asia back home and back here to our country. So the seats were much smaller than usual, very cramped together. And the leg room was almost unimaginable. But we were all game. This was going to be a big adventure. Uh, as we settled in, it was 11 o'clock at night now, we were flying out, and the um, announcement came on. Ladies and gentlemen, just try to get yourself a nice sleep tonight. <laughs> and when you wake up tomorrow, you will wake up in Hong Kong. Oh, I could feel the hands kind of like, huh? So I was trying to squeeze into the seat. <laughs> trying to sleep. Got a little sleep, and then we were awakened at 7 in the morning. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Oakland International. <laughs> We've had some electrical problems. We could not fix them. Oh, and we will have to wait until come back tonight. <laughs> okay, so we all came back that evening. The plane took off when it was supposed to. Everything was fine until we had to stop in Alaska for a four-hour layover. Okay. All right. So it can't be that bad. We'll find a better seat to sit on, surely. Well, it was a very small air, you know, airport, and there weren't yeah. any seats to find. And then uh, they were being taken. And then uh, we, maybe we could go to a snack bar. And we kind of looked around. We'll sit at the bar and, you know, no snack bar. So we kind of roughed it, and finally the, our plane was ready to leave. And when our plane was ready to leave, finally, I'm telling you, we lost all sense of civilization. We tried to push somebody out of the way so we could get over to get the best little seat left. And somebody shoved me, and, and we, you know, and I'm sure we weren't making a very good impression on the people that we were supposed to be. Uh, and we were going to have to live with these other people, these other representatives, for many years after in that group. And while we were there, we pushed and shoved each other to get what we needed. Okay, so <laughs> afterwards, many years after, um, my husband and I were doing some touring. We were touring um, Peru. <laughs> And we had just been up in the mountains, been Machu Picchu, et cetera. We were in Peru, and uh, we decided that we would fly down to the Amazon Basin. It's not a lot of fun. And we figured out we, it's going to be a small plane. We arranged to have a twin engine plane. And as we walked across the tarmac on the way to the plane, we could see it was not a twin engine plane. It was a single engine plane. OK. The Amazons are very, the, Amazon, the Andes are very sharp and packed together. And we got on the plane, and I was feeling nervous about it. And then the co pilot got on the six person plane and said, All of you here are your, I want you to take these um, oxygen masks. I want you to put them on immediately if I tell you. Oh, that made me feel really good. <laughs> so I'm sitting on the plane, and I thought, Well, I'll just look out the window. Pretend I'm not here, look out the window. So I'm looking down there, I'm thinking, surely there'll be a little valley or something. If we get in trouble, we can land there. <laughs> I tried that for a while, it didn't work. So I thought, well, I'll look at the pilot. He's just sort of directly ahead of me, it's a small plane. And I'll just watch him do the controls. And then I won't worry. So I looked at him, I looked up, I looked at the pilot. And he was not looking at the controls. <laughs> He was reading a newspaper. <laughs> and to make matters worse, the headline on the newspaper said, did yeah. you know, Diga adios, <laughs> which of course means say goodbye. <laughs> Yay! Yeah. 
friends make the feeling of ecstasy that one gets of total, total freedom. It's incredible. Once you're up in the air, you never want to come down again. It's an addiction, and it becomes an addiction. It's 1960, and I'm learning how to fly. And what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about my first cross-country solo, which is part of the training of learning to fly. And so one of the th among the things that you have to learn when you learn to fly is aerodynamics, navigation, being able to decipher a weather map, two cross-country solos, and a, an examination by an FAA examiner. Now, a cross-country solo does not mean I fly from San Francisco to New York. It simply means I fly from one airport to another. Okay. So, let me tell you a little bit about the airplane. That is a Piper Cub J3. They were built between 1937 and 1947, <laughs> and were mostly used for, uh, for learning training experiences. Now, as you notice, there were two seats, one behind the other. The pilot sits in the front. Now, it's probably the most basic airplane that they've ever built. So what you have is flight controls. <clears throat> so you had a stick that came up out of the floor. And if you tilted the stick to the right, the airplane would tilt to the right. <laughs> you tilted it to the left, the airplane tilted to the left. You pulled the stick back, the nose, nose pointed up. You pushed the stick forward, the nose pointed down. Now, there were two pedals. If you pushed one pedal, the nose would turn. If you pushed the other pedal, the nose would turn the other way. Very basic. Now, the instrumentation on this airplane, we had no radios. So once you got in the air, no one could contact you, and you can't contact anybody else. So you had a tachometer. You had an airspeed indicator. You had an altimeter. And that's basically what you had. And an oil, and an oil temperature. So this is what you flew in. And this is what, oh, and by the way, the gas tank was very elaborate. The gas tank was actually sitting in the pilot's lap. <laughs> right, right in front of you. And the gauge was a stick that came up from the gas tank, and there was a cork on the bottom. And as you used the gas, the stick would go down. Very simple. There were no markings on the stick, so you just had to do the best you could. So it's time for me to take off on my cross country. I figured did all the navigation necessary, since there were no radios and no way to understand, we did navigation that was called dead reckoning. I never liked that name. <laughs> <laughs> and basically what you did is you read a, a, a weather map and you did some calculations for wind and so on and you, and you hopefully on the railroad track that went in the same direction. <laughs> but that was it. <clears throat> so I'm going to take off. And so we start, I start to take off. Now, in these airplanes, this is about the way it was. <laughs> in any kind of wind or air, we just <laughs> Now, my flight took me right past Idlewild Airport, which became JFK a few years later. Okay. And so I'm sitting there. And I look down, and this is very exciting. There's a three-mile-long runway. And I'm just at the end of it. 
It's very exciting. And there's a jet plane taking off <laughs> right at me. I, I, I don't know what to do. The only thing I can think of is I, I left the sprinkler on her. And so I'm flying. And, and at the last minute, this jet turns away from me. And it was. That was good for the start. <laughs> well, the rest of the flight was pretty uneventful. I found the airport. It hadn't moved at all. Unfortunate. I landed. I refueled. And I went into the office to tell them to report in so that they would actually know that I had flown to this airport. Well, it was time to take off, and so I took off again. And I realized that just a couple of miles west was the New Jersey Turnpike. And I could go and fly over the New Jersey Turnpike and take it right back to New York City, where I had to go. So I did that, and I flew over there, and I'm, and I'm watching down and noticing the cars, and the cars are passing me. <laughs> <laughs> this is very, very strange. What happened is the wind had changed and it become much stronger and a headwind. So I was going about 50 miles an hour of ground speed and watching, watching all the cars go by. Well, as I'm getting close to New York City, I look at my gas gauge, and the stick was down here, and I, I don't know whether I can make it to my home airport. I better find a place to land and be cool. Take out my chart. There was no passenger to worry about, reading a newspaper. <laughs> I take out my chart, and I'm looking for an airport, and there's no airport within flight close by, except on Staten Island. And it has a big closed. <laughs> well, I decided I better I'm gonna take a chance and I'm gonna land there and see what happens. So I land and there's not a soul around, but there's a little building, and I go into the building, and there's an elderly lady sitting there, and I tell her what's going on, and she says, Well, you gotta take care of yourself. There's a gas truck out back, take the gas truck. Fill up the airplane. Fine. Well, I do that, and then I walk out to the airport, airplane, and I realize I didn't tell you. I forgot to tell you. There is no starter on this airplane, <laughs> and the way it's normally started is that the pilot gets into the cockpit. You put the brakes on, and you crack the throttle a little bit, which is like the gas pedal. And then somebody outside goes there, there and they spin the propeller. <laughs> well, there seems to be part of that formula that's missing, <laughs> like the other person. So, so I, I, I don't, there's nothing more to do but to do it. And so I put the brakes on and I crack the throttle hoping that I didn't crack it too much. If I did, the plane could take off by itself. <laughs> so, I go over there, and okay, and I spin the prop, and it doesn't chase me down the runway. It's a really good sign. <laughs> so, get back in the airplane, take off, and head for home. Past New York City, out to Long Island, where my airport is. And I land. And I go into the office, and the first thing I hear is, Idlewild Airport called about one of our airplanes interfering with their whole flight path. <laughs> Me? <laughs> anyway, the next thing they said was, where the hell were you? We were worried about the airplane. <laughs> and all I could think is, oh, 
I was able to smile to myself and think of what a wonderful adventure I had. <laughs> I could hear the cheap ting 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 of coins hitting the concrete driveway below. When I was 13, he decided I should go to a rugged canoe tan camp, a tough enough. The camp was in Quantico National Park, a two hour train ride from Chicago. The first night, I shared a bunk with another kid. And when I woke up in the morning, my hand was wet. And then there was a smell. <laughs> Later in that day, we passed towns with a population of zero, and I knew we were near camp. A gaggle of cabins in a rolling forest with pristine lakes and thousands of stars in the sky and an equal number of mosquitoes. <laughs> we bought an insect repellent bug off, which smelled like putrefied gasoline, but we got bit anyway. I found that if I scratched my bites until they started bleeding, they didn't itch anymore. I was by far the youngest kid in camp. All the other guys were rugged football players in training. They would paddle me out into the middle of the lake and jump up and down the rails until the canoe tipped over. Dive, dive, eh, eh. <laughs> There was a sauna, a cat log cabin with a wood-burning stove at the edge of a glacier-filled lake. We would sit together, naked, sweating, and then run down the pier and jump in the lake. One problem, though, leeches. <laughs> There were teeming leeches at the edge of the pier. So when you got out, you were covered with leeches. At dinner, we sang, I scream, you scream, we all scream for ice cream, rah, 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 followed by a food fight. <laughs> and then we were marched outside and told to drop your shorts and grab your ankles. At which point we were slapped to the back by a canoe paddle. At night, guys would savor their own parts under the covers <laughs> and invite me to enjoy. <laughs> the main focus of the camp, though, was the canoe trips. A two-day, a five-day, and a ten-day. The canoes were loaded down with equipment, clothes, tents, food, and the fun part was paddling on the lake, rowing together in rhythm while the canoe cut through the water and we saw the beautiful scenery going by. The rough part was the portages between lakes. Some of them were really rugged and treacherous, others over a mile long. I was way too small to even carry half a canoe, so they had me carry boxes which were a pump rope leather strap that goes across your head. I'm walking along and my neck is screaming out, I'll never be the same. <laughs> then the jocks would tease me, hey frog legs, how's it going? Sometimes we shot rapids and one time my canoe went over a 10 foot waterfall. That was an experience. Then, one of the jocks lost his canoe paddle in the rapids. So who do you think was elected to ride in the canoe all day without paddling? Right, moi. And who do you think when we got to the campsite 
was told, build that fire, pitch that tent. Right. Moi. Oh. <laughs> the next day, paddling in a driving rainstorm, ponchos flapping. I was in a two-man tent that night, light tan. When we woke up in the morning, it was black. Mosquitoes. Kind of poked at the side and a little tan came up and then it closed back up real fast. <laughs> and we put on a lot of bug off that morning. Mm. At the end of the day, I will say it was a beautiful experience running the Canadian wilderness. And my older brother sent me back one more year before he gave up. After that, I spent every summer playing golf. <laughs> Figuring that someday I would take up residence in the White House. 